All right, so today we're talking about useful plots for the analysis of high throughput data. And then we're also going to show some examples of popular but not so useful plots. All right, so we are using, again, gene expression as the motivation. A lot of the concepts we're talking about today apply to other high throughput data as well. All right, so the first, the first things I'm showing here is a plot of gene expression measurements for two arrays and it's in the this is the, this is the data as it comes out of the cell files these are AFI arrays and, and I have a little line down here see that line here that line is dividing the data 95 percent of the data is down here and the rest is up here so the only point of this plot is that you are um, the, the distribution of the, the data is very very right long tailed so in, in cases like that, it usually is better to look at the log scale. And you can look at the same data, just take, put it in a log scale or in a semi-log scale. And this is the same exact data as the previous one. So one of the first things that we see now that we didn't see before is that there's, it's not as tight as it, as it looked. Right? So there it looks like, oh wow, it's right on a line. Per almost perfect correlation. But once we put it in this scale, we see a little bit of a different story with some more vari variability down down here. So <coughs> the next thing, um, the next uh, concept that, that I'm going to talk about is MA plot. So if we're going to look for, if we're interested in, fi in finding differences. We're looking for genes that are differentially expressed. We're looking for genes that are uh, away from the diagonal. So if you're looking at this visually, then you kind of have to turn your head 45 degrees and and try to see the genes that are far away from the diagonal, like this one, and that one, and that one, and this one, this one, that one. Uh, the lines there are, represents, the red lines represents fold changes of two or more, so that's two or more in one direction above this line, two or more in, in the other direction on the other side. So if we're looking for that and we're turning our heads, we can instead turn the, the plot and that's the same data, exactly the same data, but now instead of plotting yx, we plot y minus x and x plus y divided by 2. So it's the it's y minus x, that's what the m is for, and then the average of y and x. So that's called an ma plot. It's a little bit of a pun because it's a microarray plot. This was originally made for microarrays. Now these plots are very useful in, in other contexts too. So basically we're, we're rotating the plot so that the quantity we're interested in, which is the difference, is on an act is one of the axes, and then we also have another quantity we're interested in. The average is on another axis, yet we're plotting the same exact data. It's just a rotation. All right. So if we're using graphs to try to identify genes that are, say, different in two conditions, that's a very typical thing to be doing. We do don't really want to use heat maps. Heat maps are very popular, and we're going to explain what they are in detail in another lecture. But if we're looking for genes that are different in two conditions, here we're comparing liver on the left and brain on the right, uh, and we're looking for the genes that are most different, you know, it's not that easy. We can see here there's a little cluster that's yellow here and orange there, but it's not directly looking at what we want to see, which is, is, the, is, the, is the difference, the difference in, in, in the value, the observed values. So we have experimental replicates, just like this one we just showed. Then you can make an, an, an MA plot for every pair, uh, uh, things like that, but th there's another thing we can do, and it's to take an average. Uh, like it's, a, it's kind of like an average of an MA plot. So if we have, say, an experiment where we have three, three biological replicates from each of two conditions, we can take the average of, condition, of the first condition and the second one and form the M statistic that way, and in the x-axis plot the, the entire uh, the average for the, for all the data. So then we we get this picture. Right? This, this is the MA version of that of the previous one. We already see that some of the variability is, is reduced. That's because we're taking an average now, as of three of three samples instead of one. So a lot of this that makes us suspect that a lot of this is just noise. All right. Now another little uh, int uh, good trick to know in R. There's a function called smooth scatter, and it's it's useful in cases where you want to see where the data is when you have a lot of data this this if you just plot the points uh, like we do here you, you get thousands and thousands of points plotted on top of each other you just see a, a black blob and you don't really know there's more data 
in here or is there more data down here? So the smooth scatter, um, oh yeah, this is again showing the variance reduction. The smooth scatter um, is showing us with blue shades of blue where the data is, where the data are. So we have most of the data seems to be here in this section. That's where it's most blue, uh, and there's 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 lighter blue down here, and then out here there's nothing because there's very few points, and we have or no points, and here we have with little dots the points that are considered outliers according to the algorithm used by smooth scatter. But again, we don't plot all the points. Instead, we plot density map of where the data is. It's many times it's useful. Okay, now if we're using in, in, in a previous lecture where we talked about the statistical concepts, we learned that considering gene-specific variance is very important. And these plots we've been showing, we don't, we're not doing it. We're, we're plotting the average difference. Not where the average, but the, the variability is not shown in any way. There's not, nothing having to do with p-values or anything like that. So, for example, these two genes will show, with, will show up with roughly the same m value. Um, and we want to be able to see both. Now, we could plot p-values, if we plot p-values in these two genes would show up with the same p-value, but you can see they're very different. This one has a much bigger difference than this one. This one has tighter, uh, tighter um, within, with smaller within group variance, but not as big of a effect size. So, so there is a way to show both things at the same time. That's a very useful plot called the volcano plot. Very simple. All you do is you, you, you perform some test, like a t-test, and you get a p-value from that test and you plot log the negative of log the p-value and we use log base 10 here because that way 0.01 turns into a, a, a 2 and 0.001 turns into a 3 so they turn into integers and then on the x-axis we're going to plot the effect size so we're going to see both the effect size and the p-value in one plot and it looks like this figure on the right that's an example of a volcano plot so in this figure we see the m values those are the same as these m values. But now, instead, instead of plotting the average, we're plotting something else. We're plotting the log minus 10, log base 10 p-values. So this, these two guys that have roughly the same m value, they're about 2. They're here and here. So if we're interested in something that's going to replicate another lab, does the experiment, we're probably going to pick the 2 because it has a smaller p-value than 1. Now, 3 is in a different case. It has a small p-value, but it has a very small effect size, so it might not be as, as relevant as, as, the, as, as number 2. So the, the, these, these, are the, these are the genes that we just showed. So can you tell which one's which? Right? So there's 1, 2, and 3. 1, 2, and 3. Okay, now, uh, those are just some simple plots that, 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 that we use often in, in the analysis of of high throughput data. We're going to learn about other ones once we learn about clustering and other techniques. But now I, I want to spend some time showing some of the common mistakes, some of the plots that aren't very informative and sometimes uh, hide data that are very popular. So these these slides are, most of them are courtesy of a colleague Carl Broman and he, his slides are inspired by a book by Weiner um, that's called How to Display Data Badly. And uh, Carl thinks that a lot of the problems that we see, a lot of the bad pictures we see are are due to the widespread use of, of Excel. So, so you're going to recognize some of the plots I'm going to show because they're, they're, they're in, all over in journals and, and academic presentations. Okay, so this is very, very common example. This, this plot is showing, is comparing data from two populations. So we, underneath here somewhere, some data uh, and the average is reported as uh, as the top of the bar plot. Right? So this, there's this average and this average, and then the standard error uh, of of the mean is reported with this little antenna. But underneath here, there's like several points we don't know. The plot doesn't show it based on based on the size of the standard error. We probably guess there's like ten or so, but a much better picture would be to show. Much more informative would be to actually show that data and this is the this is the data uh, where that plot comes from right? so you actually can see that there's there's a mean here and there's a mean there and there's some spread and that's that's what the spread is so much you can learn much more you can see that there it looks like they are if you just do a simple t-statistic they'll 
these tests you'll get a small p-value but you actually get to see the data another nice thing about this plot compared to the other one is that it, it doesn't start at zero there's really no reason to start at zero you have a lot of blank space if you do and the, the fact that the, that bar plot starts at zero is, is really not informative so this nice picture that shows you all the data all the information is plotted here can be made progressively worse by using say take away the points but then you start using Excel and now it looks like this you can make it even worse by adding a gratuitous 3D that actually makes it harder to read well in the previous one we see that's at 30 try to figure out how high this is can you tell it's at 30 it's not obvious um, and then you can make it into triangles make it even more difficult to interpret and color them with for no reason and now Carl, I think, makes an exaggerated one from a top view of the pyramids. Okay, so second example is a pie chart. So the pie charts are pet peeve of statisticians. It's not very informative. So here, let me just give you an example here. I'm showing you four numbers. That's what I'm all I'm trying to do is show you four numbers. So instead of showing you the four numbers, I'm making a pie chart. And... Um, I want you to try to guess what those four numbers are. This is the point of putting the pie chart. So we have three genotypes and some missing data. There's some percents. So what percent is, is AB? And I'm going to look at that and guess. I don't know. It's less than 50. It's more than 45. Well, these are the actual values. You can plot it like this if you want. It was actually 48. Now it's easy to see because I see, okay, there it is. It's 48. I don't have to guess what the area of that piece of the pie was. So even better, I think, is just to simply state the four numbers. That's information in the pie chart is just these four numbers. But again, we can make them progressively worse by using Excel 3D. You can put the, the pie chart now with the numbers. So it's what, we really look, look, what we really look like look at are the numbers, not the actual pie. Then we can add 3D to make it harder to read and then slice the pies up. Uh, for just because I guess Excel lets you do that. Okay, example three, the wrong scale. This is a plot. There's some data underneath. We can't see what the data is because it's been made into a bar plot. If we actually plot the data, we can see that that bar plot is really high because there's two outliers. We take the arithmetic mean, it makes it quite big. But if we plot the original data, we see that there's most of the data on here and then two outliers. In these cases like this, we've covered this already, we, it's better to look at the log. We look at the log, then it looks uh, like that. And it's, it's, it's much easier to see what's going on. So the original plot was actually quite deceiving, making it seem like these two things were very different when they're really not that different once you uh, exclude these two outliers. Uh, example four is a scatter plot which sometimes is plotted in this bar plot form. So here we have two numbers for, for six different um, value, for six different uh, um, per individuals or individual measurements. So the, the standard way to plot this is in a scatter plot, but sometimes for reasons that I'm not sure on, they're, they're plotted as bar plots. Instead, you know, you can plot the actual scatter plot, You're comparing those two numbers. Okay, another, this is actually a mistake that statisticians make much more than biologists and it's the use, they copy and paste from from, st from Stata or SAS or R and include uh, digits that aren't really not really necessary so here the precision is nowhere near the uh, fifth, sixth decimal point yet the, the numbers are included anyway so you really want to think about what your precision is and make a much cleaner table when you're when you're making a table. Um, now here's another example, and this is really just the, the use of gratuitous 3D to to make the plot that actually ends up making the plot hard to read. Here we we just have three lines, three three curves, um, and they're plotted in ribbon form when they can just be plotted like this and it's so so much easier to look at and, and figure out what values are what um, and it's actually you know not ugly I don't think alright so Soto 3D is another pet peeve of many statisticians 
So I'm, I'm, I, pl I put this picture up, um, and I, I usually ask my class in, in, in the classroom, which one of these angles is a 90 degree angle? So, you know, our eyes tell us that this is a 90 degree angle, but if you, if you look closely, you say you take a piece of paper and that has a 90 degree angle, you're going to see that all of them are 90 degree angles. And it's the, the Soto 3D makes us conf get confused and not see what's, what's going on. So here are some, some of the, ver this is a typical plot of Soto 3D. I'm going to explain later why, why we don't like it. Uh, there's, you know, they're ubiquitous, they're all over. So here, the problem with, with 3D is that we humans cannot really see in 3D. We see in somewhat, somewhere between two and three dimensions. And when it's pseudo 3D, it makes things even harder because this is really not 3D. This is a, a, a rendering in a two, 2D uh, uh, space. So I'm, I have these points in a pseudo 3D graph, and I'm, I'm wondering how, what splits those two groups. So if you look at this picture, I draw this line that is at the z equals 4 line when everything else is fixed. If I have a plane that goes through the z equals 4, it would appear to divide the data into two groups except for these two down here. But when I look at that same line in, in another scale, in, in just two dimensions, like here, you can see that it's not quite what we thought it was. That yellow line is this yellow line. This is now plotting just z and y. And we can see that in two dimensions, we can actually see it much, much clearer. If you just use Z and Y, you can split the data pretty well. And um, there was really no need at all to have that, that 3D plot. All right, so this is the last um, slide. Um, be accurate and clear. Let the data speak. Show as much of the data as you can um, without making it too complicated. And this is a message from Carl, science not sales, avoid unnecessary frills, especially gratuitous 3D. All right, and that is the end of the lecture.